So it's a uh, privilege and an honor to uh, introduce uh, Dr. David Haynes, who's a professor of otolaryngology and neurosurgery, uh, and also the chief of the neurotology division and program director of the neurotology fellowship uh, at uh, the otology group at Vanderbilt. And so he's going to talk to us today on building a practice in neurotology. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing your talk. Thank you, David. Well, thanks, Bill. You guys hear me? Yes, we're good. Perfect. Um, yeah, I know this is a bit of an odd talk, but it's something I've had more of an interest in lately, but I've had an interest in this my entire life. Um, you know, what, what does it take to, to build a practice and, and why have some been more successful than others at, at that? And what are the, uh, how do you, can you scale the, those thoughts out to, to others? And so, so I'll share with you some of the things that I have um, learned and certainly speaking to a place like the house group, uh, I, I doubt I'll say anything you guys don't already know as the premier uh, otologic center in the world, but um, I'll just share some of my thoughts that I've had. You know, you want to get a building block in, in your head on what does it take? What will it take to build a destination center, a center where people travel to, uh, to, to have their surgery, to have their care, to train? Um, and these aren't in any real order, but I, I, I do think that that number one is super important, that, that you, your performance uh, and your outcomes, that I, I don't think you can build a destination center just based, say, on basic science research, for example. I think that, that really it starts with uh, someone deciding to, to perform surgery at the highest level. And I, I really do believe that that's important. Now, if you look at uh, our program, you know, which was started, of course, by Mike Glasscock, a friend of Daryl's and others, uh, started in this office. Daryl, you may have been there, um, unassuming uh, at best. You know, this, I had to even, it's gone now. I had to find this thing on this little machine called Google Time Machine and dial the clock back to see if someone had actually taken a picture of it. And, but yet people came here to train uh, people came here to have surgery from all over the world, but there's no Greek fountains and, and you know, statues and, um, you know, columns here. This was just, he had built a reputation of an excellent uh, surgery, and he founded our, our journal in this building, Otology, Neurotology, and Surgery of the Ear, and others in this less than assuming building. And people, you can see the, the list of fellows here that, that trained uh, in this this building, including Lloyd Minor, uh, in a private practice, you know the the current dean at Stanford trained in a private practice building here that looked this was it in Nashville, Tennessee. You know we've uh, now celebrated uh, in 2020 our 50th year and uh, our 40th year of our of our cochlear implant program, and continue to move forward. When I was a fellow or a fellow applicant. You know, the three places to train, um, and there were, there were others, but of course we're Los Angeles, uh, the house group, Zurich, Switzerland with um, um, Yugo Fish, and, 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 and of course here, right? And that was just my, my opinion, but that was a kind of going opinion at that time. And it's changed and fluctuated somewhat through the years. But I, I have to admit, I was, I was thinking, why did these three cities with nothing in common all have uh, a one thing in common, which was a, an excellence in uh, ear surgery uh, and a place to train to do that, that surgery? And I, be, I was intrigued with that. And my interest in, in how programs became what they were and uh, started very young. I, I had a significant amount of hand surgery when I was a young child. Uh, my family moved from Southwest Virginia to Louisville, Kentucky, because that's where um, the Kleinert Hand Center was. You know, not you know, in New York City or Chicago, but in Louisville, Kentucky. And, and this is some of the pictures from that office when I went to visit there recently for another uh, trip. And really it starts with someone deciding to create a, a center of excellence. And, and if you kind of dial everything back to how did this center get here in this city of, of, 
uh, it was someone decided to create that. And, and how do you put structure around that? How do you say, well, I want to do that too. I, I want to create a house group or a otology group or a you go fish or uh, how do you do that? There's not a lot of real uh, how, how to do it books. Um, I wish there were. You know, we've written a little bit about ours, and, and if you want to read about sort of our evolution, this is in the Otology Neurotology Open. Uh, I've asked um, Bill to, to write a similar history for uh, uh, this series and, and, and there, and I hope you're working on that, Bill. I'd be very interested to read, especially uh, with my interest in these things. A lot of this is the culture of a place that has to be established. Culture actually means uh, do what the general would do or think like a general. You know, it's, it's not, uh, it's a big picture outlook on uh, an overall, um, uh, and I think we kind of know what culture is. It's, it's uh, a culture of academia, of academic excellence, of, of um, surgical excellence that it's hard to put your finger on, but you feel it when you walk into a place uh, like the house group and like, like other places. It's this big picture and it has to be maintained. Uh, culture can be lost. You see it in football programs and basketball programs and culture can be changed, but it has to be maintained at a high level. Uh, culture will change. In fact, change is, is super important for a program to move forward. And you can see that in, in places in their history. Um, but create, creating that environment and maintaining that environment and changing that environment to, to match up with the, the future um, is super important for these, these centers of excellence. Defining what's best is, is um, you know, I want to build the best program in the world, but what is that, right? I asked my partners that once. I said, how do, you, how do we build the best program in the world? And there's a guy that actually studies strategy uh, and the forces that, it, that you're up against to build a, a great program or a great business. His name's Michael Porter. And I got all these different answers, you know, and how do you build the best? And it's, well, it's the most faculty or the most funded research dollars. It's the most clinical trials. It's by the uh, number of surgical procedures, US News and World Report rankings, um, you know, largest geographic range of where your patients come from. And, all of these may be true uh, and may be part of making the best. It's like the best car though, you know, it depends on what you're building and what your definition uh, of that is. And it could be different. And, and I think all of us as partners in a, in a group may have a different definition when we're working and striving to make our program the best. I think CME and a house group and us have always felt that CME is, is crucial. Um, it brings referring providers to our centers. Um, it, it's an opportunity for our fellows to teach and to organize. Um, there's some marketing involved. Uh, it's a, it's a, improves the culture. It, it helps to establish that culture that can be lost so quickly when you bring people and learners in, onto your campus and, and learn um, the techniques that are important for them in their practice and, and for their patients. Um, Embracing new technologies that we were one of the first to embrace endoscopic ear surgery. And I think um, due to that, I think our residents and fellows learned uh, how to do this early. Uh, we sent Alejandro Rivas, who is, I think, somewhere in here, right here. We sent him to, to Italy to learn how to do this back in the early days of this. And we began, so even in 2018, we had our fifth annual course then and at, at best it's a it's a um, it's a new technique uh, that that our residents uh, learn um, and uh, there's really no downside in, in at least looking into and embracing certain technologies as they come forward we posted hearing preservation workshops and cochlear implant meetings uh, we have several meetings here as does the house group and, we, and it really is a culture builder and it's part of our mission to, to educate. And um, these are the best days we have. I think it's the only day I think we're all in the same room at the same time, um, teaching and learning from each other. Some other pictures here. 
Um, these webinars, you know, during the pandemic, just like like uh, the house house group um, had to pivot and couldn't invite people to their campus. And it was an eye opener. And so we would have these webinars and we would have these filmed uh, lecture series. Uh, here's this empty lab with Liz Perkins, my current partner, and I uh, discussing something. And yet when we looked to see who attended this, uh, our audience was much bigger than we've ever had ever in, in the past. And it, it's a new way to, to look at, at things and look at education and, and look at spreading the message of uh, education. You know, we've had uh, some experience with Twitter, uh, with um, uh, smaller uh, not-for-profit courses that are being put on um, social media, um, chats and things. And I, I know you guys uh, have a lot of experience with that too. Um, I think awareness, if you look at certain things in our field that are um, people are and I'll get to that in a minute about cochlear implant awareness. Uh, we can't, we're not getting the message out there the old way. And so we have to look at new ways to get the message out of. Our friend, uh, Sean McMinnemy uh, has a radio show on NYU Sirius XM radio. I've probably been on that show five times and I, I look at every opportunity to be on there. And I remember one time I had to run back to my office from the clinic to be on this show. I was on that show for 15 minutes. We talked about uh, cochlear implants, and um, at the end of that show, I asked the the uh, ma the um, uh, manager of the program. I said, "How many people heard what I just said?" And you know, because I just given the same talk to, to a patient one on one. You know, the old way of our of physician education was talking to a patient in my clinic in the room with the door closed. Uh, but I, I said, I realized I'd said the exact same thing on this radio show about the importance of um, of uh, restoring sound. And, and she goes, well, you know, she, she went through some marketing analysis, but she said uh, between six and 8 million people heard that, right? And so it made me think of a different way to, to get our message across than the old school way. And we always have to be thinking differently. Um, we've actually have, uh, looked at uh, the value of social media presence and certainly in the residency programs and with younger some of the younger people on this call, it, it, it's very important for you to get to know our, our program and our educational programs via social media. And we've proven that. We have a YouTube channel uh, with our, many of our talks. A lot of our Grand Rounds talks, when I was in charge of our Grand Rounds, we would have talks in, in a way similar to what I'm talking about today, uh, not, not quite as medically uh, uh, heavy as we've had in the past, but more things that would appeal in a big university like Vanderbilt to the head and neck team and to the uh, rhinology team and to the laryngology team. So we would have uh, speakers that could extrapolate the, these, uh, these lectures onto their own services as opposed to say me speaking about cochlear implants for an hour. And, and that's been a very popular um, um, change in our educational program. To, to broaden the uh, topics for at least that one hour where we're all together on Friday. These are some podcasts that um, I've participated in and I'm sure you guys are familiar with Head Mirror. That's Matt Carlson, one of our former uh, residents has set that up, this asynchronous learning, learning that you can do on a treadmill or walking in the park or driving in to, to work. And I think that now uh, that's a primary source of education as opposed to sitting down in a quiet room with a, a large textbook on your lap, the way uh, I learned. Putting together multidisciplinary teams is, is, is essential. Um, th this is, um, I think, again, speaking to this group, I don't need to go into this in much detail, but this, this, this is the key to success uh, is, getting that team together, maintaining that, that team, and setting um, a, a culture where uh, you can work together. We have, um, uh, and, and as you meet and as you set goals, that's how you reduce length of stay and improve outcomes and improve your OR efficiency and care delivery. 
you can put teams together around anything. You know, we, most people have cochlear implant teams and skull based teams. We even have a single sided deafness team. Um, you know, as as years have gone on, I I started with um, there was no treatment for single sided deafness when I began my my practice. Um, you had these talks of learning how to live with it, basically, and and now. There's so many options that we have had to create a team and objectify the evaluation process. So things change uh, and your programs have to change too. And putting together a team around any complicated uh, problem where there's multiple options um, is the best way to deliver care. I think telehealth, I was an early adopter of telehealth. This is a picture of me. Uh, in uh, 2019, early, uh, January of 19, having our first uh, telehealth uh, appointment, pre-pandemic. Um, it was so um, unique that I had an IT guy in the room and everybody was in there watching. I put a suit on to look good for the pictures. Uh, now it's just part of um, practice. Uh, but back then it was a, a big deal. Uh, like you uh, guys do there, that your, your patients come from long distances, gas cost a lot of money being off work, being away from your family uh, is important. And to uh, have a pre-op appointment or a review of a film or review of a CT scan, uh, when someone can just close the door um, in a principal's office, a teacher, uh, have the appointment and not miss work and not have to travel and not have to travel into a big city and park in a parking garage is, is crucial. We need to do more of this. I know some centers are creating where they're their last five or last 10 appointments of the day are via telehealth. They send their nurses home, they send their front desk home, and they continue with um, uh, five or so more patients. Um, to, and it helps certainly their overhead and their bottom line and, and patient satisfaction. We've uh, looked at Google ad campaigns and, you know, they're certainly worth the, the uh, uh, cost benefit uh, of, of the analysis that we do. Um, Innovation is the key. You have to differentiate yourself from other programs. Can't do the same thing and expect people to travel great distances if you're doing the same thing that the program uh, in their own backyard will do. Discovery is important um, for an academic center. And uh, I'll just say that and looking at your outcomes, benchmarking your results with other centers and Determining if uh, if you're on par with others, and, and if so, uh, great. If not, why? I mentioned change. Uh, change is something that we as physicians have uh, always had to manage. Right? We go to meetings to change. Right? You don't go to the meetings to hear yourself speak. You go to meetings to hear others speak and learn about different ways of doing things. So. Uh, when I hear the phrase, physicians don't like change, I'm like, well, we, we go to the academy. I go to the ANS meeting. I go to Super Saturday to change the way I, I do things and to hear new ways of doing things. Um, to give an idea how important change is, that this is the uh, Fortune 500 from 1955 when it was um, initiated, and now 88% of those companies are gone. And as, as you do an analysis, there's, there's likely a, a, a theme that they were unable to change their business model or unwilling to change their business model uh, going forward. Um, but I think doctors are change opportunities. And I think the younger folks on this call that have had to train through the pandemic uh, are probably more adaptable to change than, than people in my generation. I'm gonna go over a little bit about um, some statistics and, and what we've done here to try to, to um, improve upon these numbers. If you look at all of these people with hearing loss, 48 million people with hearing loss, uh, of those who need hearing aids, 16% have them. Of those who need a cochlear implant, that means their quality of life uh, and their lifestyle and their work experience and their family experience and everything about the one life they have would be improved if they could get access to a cochlear implant. Um, and uh, we've been successful at getting uh, that technology into 6% of people. So you could argue we have failed miserably in this regard, right? And whose fault is that? Well, I, I've always felt like it was um, 
our fault, right? If I consider myself an expert in cochlear implants, I don't expect the patient to design the system or the companies to design the system. Um, the hospital's not going to design a system of, of care delivery. It has to be uh, the owners of, of this, this technology, which is uh, us. And, um, you know, and if you look at that number, we, we have failed in this in some way, shape or form or every way, shape and form. We, it was part of this consensus to, to improve awareness. Um, what we did a few years ago, I did an, an, an MBA, it was a healthcare MBA. And uh, one, one of the um, areas I enjoyed the most was learning how, how uh, about operations. There's an entire science around operations and, and flow. Um, every time you order a certain drink at Starbucks, there's a science and operations around that. And so healthcare, I don't think we ever learn this. You know, we, we assume that someone else is learning this and doing this, um, somebody with a suit on um, uh, down the hall in, in our academic centers, but it's, it's really not, not done to the level that we think it should be. Operations, is, here's a quote from Sun Tzu. This is Operations 101, know your enemy and know yourself. And often we don't know that, right? Do you know um, when your next OR availability is? Do you know how many patients that you um, saw last month? Do you know how many more you can see? Do you know um, how much more you could expand if, if you needed to? Uh, all of these, these facts uh, about your operations and how you deliver care, um, we really don't know. We just sort of show up, see our clinics and, and go home sometimes and, and without the big picture look on how we can improve uh, this delivery, which we're, in, at least in cochlear implants, we're failing right now. Um, we've tried to write a bit about barriers and, and uh, an analysis of, of what, why those barriers exist. Um, this is Nancy Williams, a, a colleague of mine who has studied uh, these barriers towards people going from not being able to hear with a hearing aid to a cochlear implant and trying to put some uh, structure around why, why this um, happens. And a lot of that is the outcome uncertainty that patients have and the process variability um, and public opinion, all of which we should have some ownership in, especially the process variability. These are some of the things that you may or may not know. You should be able to answer those. I should be able to answer these. What's my OR capacity? How long does it wait from the first phone call to the time a patient gets in to see you? Um, how long does it take from the time the patient sees you to, to getting the, the, the implant? You know, how, many, how much audiology uh, capacity do you have to do implants? How much surgeon capacity do you have? All, all of these things are really important. Because if you're the head of a cochlear, cochlear implant program or you have a leadership role, these are the things you need to be thinking of. We've grown. Uh, we do over 300 cochlear implants a year now, uh, yet we maintain that single digit penetrance, meaning that we should think towards the future of being able to do 500, 1,000 implants a year, 2,000 implants a year. The average program, uh, I'm told, does 30 implants a year. Um, that's not going to be adequate. As we expand indications, uh, that number will get worse, not better. I've actually given this talk, and, and people have said, well, once, we be able to, once we're able to expand these indications, we'll be able to improve that number. And it's actually the opposite. Uh, if we don't have a system in place that can handle these patients, and if we're only putting in two to 6% now, how does more patients to, that need an implant help that number? It makes it worse. Uh, and then if we start really doing more hybrids and really uh, doing more single-sided deafnesses, you know, patients will be uh, uh, in big trouble. And you have to look at this as our problem. Uh, it's not someone else's problem. It's not the company's problem. They've developed the, tech, the uh, technology. We've failed at getting it in people who need it. You know, we look at chat rooms and things from time to time that, that will uh, help us to understand what, what are the struggles with getting in to see us. Um, some of the things you read on these chat rooms are, are um, you know, um, painful. And, you know, it might be a coordinator issue. It might be a front desk issue. It might be 
uh, distance traveled, things like that. But it, it, they all are learning opportunities for you to design a program better for yourself. We've even sent out polls to our referring doctors on which, uh, what are your, uh, what are your access issues, and what can we do better. Uh, patient access is always uh, important to our referring docs. Um, familiarity is important, so we try to get to know our our physicians where they can call us and text us and communicate with us as they need to. We actually looked at where our patients tend to come from for uh, cochlear implants, and this is an easy thing to do. It basically takes the uh, zip codes of, of the patients that you um, see uh, and operate in and, and you know maps it out on a, on a heat map. And it will help you see what you need to be doing, you know, and what, what you need to, what type of care you need to um, be delivering. Um, and it's different from someone who lives a mile away to someone who lives 300 miles away and, and or farther. Here's another uh, version of that a little more recently. And this is sort of um, uh, the zip codes of, of the patients that we see where they come from and what we need to be doing with this information. If you kind of drop a pin down in the bulk of that density, you're like, well, there's a patient right there. That's, that's um, pretty close. It's right in the middle of that density. It's probably not too far away, but that's actually five hours away from us. That's in Johnson City, uh, Tennessee. And we get a lot of patients from this area up in East Tennessee. Um, that's a long ways to come for a single appointment. So years and years ago, we developed, uh, I'm gonna talk about this is, uh, we've looked at this also, Ashley and Siri, one of our former uh, residents and uh, worked with Matt Carlson and, and others here and looking at um, uh, the catchment area of, um, of cochlear implant programs and, and how do we improve and optimized uh, the delivery process. Um, and it's an interesting paper there. So if you think of uh, a, a patient that lives five hours away and in the old school way of come in to see the doctor, yes, you need an implant, go home, come in and get an, a CT, come in and get an MRI, come in and see anesthesia, uh, come in and get your uh, pre-op evaluation and your audiology evaluation. Uh, that's not uh, sustainable uh, for patients. That's not uh, the way to deliver care for people um, that live in um, areas over two. It's not a good way to deliver care and somebody lives an hour away. Um, some of these people are staying in hotels that see us and some of these people are driving great distances and missing work. And for children, we've had as kids miss enough work where they get held back a year, which is unacceptable as well. So how do we improve? We map this out. This is the value stream mapping. You can map this out. You can you can even look at how much care cost by looking at what you're paying someone per hour, how many minutes it takes for them to do that, um, and um, adding that total up. That's called TDABC, time derived activity based uh, costing. Um, we actually have designed a very um, efficient system. Despite this looks complicated, but we do a lot of screening. We do a lot of work on the front end. We bring people in on one day and we've coordinated this day where they get their CI candidacy, their testing, their surgery evaluation, their surgery scheduled, and then they go home and then they have surgery and then they come back for the activation. Um, and we've optimized this. Each time you, you, you map this out, there's ways to optimize it. For example, you look at what does audiology do here? Uh, what does surgery do here? Can we reduce some of these appointments? Um, that's day one, day two, day three. How do we optimize that? Most of these were spent waiting for the next step. If you look at the process from the first phone call at the beginning to the end where you've done 12 months of uh, mapping, um, it was a very long, tedious process. And we wonder why we have a 6% penetrance with this uh, 1.5 at uh, hour op, uh, operation. Why would a why would a one hour operation um, be so tedious and, and so uh, egregious? And we map this out and we look at ways to to improve it. As I said, most are spent of that time uh, in the wait periods between these processes. Now, what we did, we did a pilot study a few years ago where we said, why don't we do all this in one day? Why don't we telehealth and screen and 
uh, see if a patient's a candidate. We hold surgery for the day and we bring them in uh, in the morning. They show up in PO and they go through this entire process and they walk out with a cochlear implant. Uh, so they walk in, you know, never, we've never met them before except via telehealth. And then they walk out with a cochlear implant. And that proved to be quite successful. We call that the same day patient consultation cochlear implant uh, delivery system. Um, you know, this wasn't an overnight success, if you will. This was uh, 30 years of trying to optimize the system so that the next step in optimization was to do the surgery the same day as well. People who live um, um, you know, 200 miles away uh, that need family and friends, they're elderly, they, they have to get uh, their daughter to fly in from Phoenix or other places to, to bring them for these appointments, this, this is the option that they would they choose. Um, our next step is to, uh, after surgery, not have to ever see them back uh, via remote programming. Um, we can evaluate them working with their uh, local uh, teams to, to look at their uh, incision, which is a pretty easy post-op appointment, as we all know, uh, and then uh, do the programming um, via uh, a home computer and save them again this long, tedious drive in, um, at least some of those, those visits. And we've done this as well, but this is in its infancy. Um, this is another paper um, we wrote about this, this process. There's a whole science around implementation strategy. If you look at um, you know, new innovations, uh, almost all research is on discovery. It's on discovering a, a new technique, a new operation, and a new uh, technology. And uh, almost zero amount of time is spent in implementation. And some of the failures of successful discoveries are, are due to poor implementation. And, and so, um, there's a science behind this. It's very interesting on how you implement um, a process uh, for success. Um, there's a lot of things we learn along the way, uh, but I think this is the way of the future. And, it, and if you think that that doesn't make sense, well, think back to the 6% uh, success we're having now. So any idea is welcome to improve that number, in my opinion. We did a lot of pre-visit video education. Um, this is uh, Renee and some of our patients and some of our team uh, discussing um, what will happen on your day here. Uh, this is uh, what, what an implant's all about, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're welcome to look at these. Um, we wondered if that was an effective way to communicate. And um, we looked at patients who had um, looked at these videos and patients who had come here in person, the retention went for them was better than uh, via the videos than it was via the live uh, instruction from us. And it's not surprising. I mean, we're, we're probably more used to watching instructional videos or TV or, or any kind of uh, a video and retaining things than we are probably via live conversation. So we've pro proven that this technique is effective for patients and desired. Um, we have coordinators and, and certainly um, they're essential to this process. This is highly uh, coordinated care. If you wonder, um, are patients happy with this? This is one of our patients who did the surgery this way. And he was so happy because he couldn't um, drive. Uh, family had to fly in from out of state to bring him here. And he, um, gave us a, a very a generous gift to keep the program going. And so that kind of tells you, I, I think, the importance of uh, optimizing care for patients, thinking out of the box. This is one of our residents, when she was a student, she asked if she could help us uh, do some research. And, and, and I was telling uh, you earlier about implementation and um, science, and, and this is a science. And I said, why don't you meet this patient on Friday down in the garage? <laughs> And then you follow them until they leave. And then you keep a list of things um, of what worked and what didn't. And, you know, in, in an earlier day, I, I didn't like people coming up to me and saying, you know, uh, you know, hi, uh, Dr. Haynes, I'm Mary from Quality. 
and you know we we need to talk to you about some things that are wrong in your clinic or the weights or this or that or callbacks and things like that and you almost didn't want to hear about that right you're like eh, you know um, I, I don't want to deal with all that but really as as I've, as I've matured and as I've done this MBA I actually seek that I, I ask the student to get a long list of things because the more things that are wrong the more you can fix and more you can make better and unless you see them and, and I'm not seeing what happens in the parking garage and in the check-in and um, in the holding areas as, as I'm not there. And so I can't see that and I can't improve that. And to, to create systems where you can uh, see those problems and fix those problems is essential to care delivery as well. We've optimized this process now where we have a, uh, where is it here? My hearing health bundle is one of our early bundles. You know, we, we have maternity, bundle, spine, um, hip implant, weight loss, and then, and then uh, a cochlear implant bundle. So we've optimized this to a point and we've uh, been able to determine what our costs are, uh, not what your charges are, the charges don't matter, it's what your costs are and be able to produce a, a cost uh, and a price, if you will, for what it would take if you wanted to pay one bundled price to get a cochlear implant and, and that's unique too. We hope that that helps with that um, low percentage of penetrance that we're working on. Um, all this work, they actually named a, 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 a bragging, but th this is this just to show you that our, my department named this award <laughs> after me for the um, innovation we've done in, in delivering this care. And, and I'll show you this, not because I'm, I am proud of the award, but I wanna show you that you don't have to be tucked away in a lab somewhere um, you know, with a lab coat on uh, uh, to, to innovate. You, know, you can do this right in your clinic, right in your OR. Uh, and um, and it, it, it really benefits patients very quickly uh, to do this. And so um, don't think that that's not appreciated. So in conclusion, um, and again, I'm, I don't think I've given this talk to a place like the house group, which is already uh, built a, a destination center without peer. Um, but I, I think it's it's so much easier to come to work when you're working at a place that's delivering care at a super high level. Uh, it's a good feeling. I know Dr. Brackman Slattery uh, have that feeling too when you, you, you go into work and it's the same, you, same amount of work and it's the same number of hours, but you've built the, this center and it really is uh, important for uh, the delivery of care for patients. You always have to think of ways to deliver the care differently. If not, someone else will. And if someone develops a better system, uh, you'll lose patients to that process. Um, always be looking at processes. I think as surgeons, uh, we're looking at ways to uh, innovate in the operating room, but there's ways to, to, to uh, um, to uh, develop care outside of the operating room. I remember my first day of operations and the professor says, any, um, any, um, any of you have experience in operations? And um, you know, they went around the class and, and someone was saying, yeah, I, I was in charge of operations for the Eastern seaboard of my company's packaging and this, this and that. And they, there were two surgeons in this MBA and they got to us and like, no, we, we don't have any experience. And I was driving home and I'm like, wait a minute, we, we have experience in operations. They're even called operations. We do them every day. And that's what an operation is, is a process of, of, improve, of improvement. But so we're experts at operations, at least as, as far as they are within the operating room. But we're far from experts outside of the operating room and operations and improving uh, delivery systems. Identify the problems, be a problem solver. We do tend to be... Um, you know, we're experts in the OR and, in, 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 but like outside of the OR, we, we tend to complain about the system uh, rather than, and then we feel like it's someone else's problem. It, it, as we should know at this point, it's not, and no one else will, will make it better. And we have to be active in that process. Um, you can use these tools, um, process analysis to, to uh, gain insight to where the delays there are always a delay. There's always a bottleneck in your process, right? So as soon as you fix the bottleneck, then the next 
longest task is will become the bottleneck. So this is like renovating a, a large building. You 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 finish it in one end and you start over again because you can always streamline. And as bundled payments come forward, uh, the more you streamline your process, the the, the better.